What is this great conversation you're about to hear? Hello everyone, this is W, host of the High Art on the Edge page. I'm an online event planner that supports artists' work from all over the world. They create the product. I help organize and execute a memorable event on social media for their fans, family members, and friends. What do Sid Barrett, Olivia Newton-John, and the Soft Boys all have in common? They all come from the great place of Cambridge, England. But did you also know there's a very talented gentleman who's been dazzling our ears with his phenomenal work in bands such as the Charlottes, Low Gold, and most notably, Slow Dive. Let's not forget about his ambient music, which has pushed the boundaries of extraordinary sounds. His name is Simon Scott. In addition to those projects, he operates a business called SPS Mastering, which has really grown over the past several years. In today's conversation with Simon, find out more about his childhood experiences in Cambridge, influence in his life, outrunning some bullies, the Three Quarter Skies Project, and of course, an update on Slow Dive's current sellout tour. So, grab yourself a drink, have a seat, sit back and enjoy a musician who continues to ascend higher and higher with his extraordinary craftsmanship. His wide variety of work is masterful and his professional career is truly on fire. Hello, everyone. This is W. A. K. William, host of the High Art on the Edge page. Today, I am very proud and excited to host a very special, extraordinary event with a gentleman you may be familiar with as a drummer, producer, engineer. He's kind of the jack of all trades. Let's bring in Simon Scott from Slow Dive. Hello, Simon. How are you? Hi, William. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing quite well on this uh, beautiful fall afternoon here. Um, how are things going for you? Things are going great. Have a day off from the uh, slow dive adventures in North America. So I'm chilling in Lincoln, Nebraska right now. And uh, how's the tour going so far? It's been pretty phenomenal. It's been sold out every night. And the response to playing the new songs has been very, very cool. So, uh, yeah, very happy how it's going. Thanks. Wonderful. And I know the album has been receiving great buzz and praise. So you couple that with the tour and good things. Um, okay. So we're not here so much to talk about Slow Dive. We're here to talk about this new kind of outfit, Three Quarter Skies, and uh, the new album that's going to be released quite soon. But before we get into the album, I want you to take us all the way back, kind of the beginning of your childhood growing up in Cambridge. How did that experience in your childhood shape you as the person you are today? Uh, that's a great question. Um, Cambridge is the birthplace of Pink Floyd and was the home of Sid Barrett. <laughs> and... Um, I mean, geographically, cartographically, it's it's very, very low, very flat. Um, and just outside it, where I kind of lived, is a place called the Fens, which is basically reclaimed land. And it was an old swamp, and um, it's just full of wildlife and full of green greenery, really. And um, so Cambridge is, like, really kind of sleepy, very green, very nice, but you know, occasionally when I would walk around, I'd hear some absolute lunatic shouting his head off about the Queen, and it would turn out to be Sid Barrett. So as a kind of 11, 12-year-old who's starting to get interested in, you know, different flavours of music, like maybe The Cure, The Smiths, um, you know, sort of more alternative stuff, there was this character, and I was like, I have to check out Sid Barrett's work. And I went and bought Piper at the Gates of Dawn when I was like maybe 13 and it kind of exploded my head. And then when I was a little older and I was kind of allowed to sneak into a pub unnoticed, maybe 15 or 16, I would see him at the bar drinking Guinness. But I was never brave enough to go up to Sid Barrett and go, you're my hero. <laughs> to drugs. I'd love to talk to you and get into your mind. He kind of scared me because he was very intensely staring to his pint of Guinness, you know. <laughs> but that that kind of freedom for creating new forms of music which the early floyd did was was really kind of informative and made me look really deeply at music so cambridge shaped me quite profoundly really but not just with sid and that music but also like the the wildlife and the juxtaposition of 
being in the city centre with the noise and then 10 minutes later being out in the middle of a field surrounded by wildlife thinking both is both are very cool, you know. Right. right. And when I was growing up, my older brother was a huge influence on my musical tastes. So I want to know from you, uh, who was bringing music, musical flavor to your life? Were it parents, aunt, uncle, grandparents? Yeah, uh, that's a great question as well. My brother and sister are older than me, a lot older than me. So when I was like 11, my brother was 22. My sister was 19. And I was hearing Kate Bush coming through one wall, Black Sabbath coming through another oh. wall. And that was just like, you know, um, that was my kind of, that was my, as well as say, that was kind of my gateway into music. So I was listening to Motorhead and Black Sabbath and some really kind of heavy, heavy rock stuff. Mm -hmm. Digging that, especially as I was learning to play drums and stuff. But then my sister would be playing, the, um, you know, Kate Bush and mm -hmm. kind of more ethereally stuff and Fleetwood Mac and stuff, um, which I'd play guitar along to and try and figure out the guitar lines. And, and then my brother one day, someone gave him a, an old guitar and um, that uh, it's an old electric guitar that I could plug into a stereo that I had in my room. And that just evolved into me kind of like writing and getting really kind of involved in the process of creating music myself. But um, my dad was, um, he was a keyboard player, he was a pianist and okay. uh, he kind of was really encouraging like, Oh, you've got some talent here. And, you know, he he ended up buying me like a really crap drum kit, but like a twenty five pound with like a forty dollar drum kit from the paper, and I set it up and and kind of learned to play that and took a few lessons and um. So yeah, my family are really important, you know, which is really cool that they they gave me that encouragement. Being a school teacher of twenty plus years, I had the great privilege of working with students from all walks of you know, learning modalities. Did you enjoy your experience at school while growing up? <laughs> I found it dull. Okay. It's, it's, you know, I did, I found it dull. Um, and I just, I just lived for the moments where I could get out of class and I was listening to music on cassettes a lot and I'd have a Sony Walkman and I'd walk around listening to like Bauhaus and Cocteau Twins, The Smiths, The Cure, those kind of bands initially. And, um, that was what I lived for and get started going to gigs. And, but, you know, also there was literature that came in and I started to read um, quite a lot and that, that kind of served me really well. I started to really enjoy the, the kind of time travel you get with books and the otherworldliness of, you know, fiction and, um, and also geography, like learning about the landscape and stuff was quite important. But um, that wasn't until I, I was maybe a little bit older. I think around the ages of sort of like 13, 14, 15, I just wanted to dye my hair black and play music and hang out with my buddies, you know. Did your parents support that um, kind of unique out of the box approach to life? Uh, I don't think they had any, I don't think they had any say in it really. You know, I, I was kind of obsessed by creating music in my room, buying records, reading as much as I could about musicians. And I think they just thought this is his thing. And because I could play guitar, I can sing, I was drumming. They'd be like, he's, a, he actually is pulling this off. He's actually up there, right? <laughs> it sounds pretty good which um, so I think they kind of left me to it, you know, maybe put a thicker door on my bedroom so they couldn't like, you know, hear the drums and stuff quite so loud. But I understand that um, you're a, a big fan of movies. It's a cinema. Yeah. 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 David Lynch is a massive inspiration. Uh, Why? Rick. I really like the way, like, you know how Sid Barrett would take you to another world and it would be really fantastical and, you know, um, you'd have to you'd have to listen just to try and figure out what the hell is going on because it's quite surreal and uh, and David Lynch films draw you in like that. There's moments where you're like, "This is crazy and cool," but what the is going on? I just you know. <laughs> so you go back and you watch Blue Velvet again or Mulholland Drive or uh, whatever you know, and those films are visually really 
fantastic. The soundtrack is fantastic. A battle in schools are great, but the music that they use to um, really highlight some of the kind of crazy stuff that people psychologically were going through. Um, you know, yeah, there's too many examples to, to kind of go on about that, but yeah. And the darkness in there, you know, for some reason I was really drawn to dark stuff as well, I guess, because I was listening to goth music and, um, you know, kind of trying to figure out the, the darkness in music and in, in films and, you know, and when you're when you're a teenager, you you witness darkness. You know, I remember being chased because I had some Chelsea boots, and and there was like the, <laughs> this crowd of casual dudes in pastel sweaters, just like you know, calling me all these names. And I got chased by about eight of them, but luckily I'm pretty I'm a pretty good runner, so I never got like I never got like punched or anything. But that was those scary moments where you're like, why are people such mm-hmm. you know, these are my people, and they and hate. I them. wonder. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up David Lynch because the way that you have used soundscapes orally, right? He is such a master of doing that in his films like Blue Velvet and the shot of the going into the ear, uh, Mulholland Drive, and of course, The Elephant Man. And uh, we'll get into your soundscapes and your kind of that work a little bit. Um, tell us some of your biggest influences on your life. It could be a teacher. It could be a parent. Um, you had you had mentioned, uh, you know, your brother, or sister, anything like that. Well, that's a difficult question to answer because I sort of take inspiration from loads of different places. Um, you know, for for really listening to the natural world, um, whatever, however we define that, but you know, being out in the middle of. Um, kind of more rural landscapes that that was my dad because he was an architect and a surveyor and he used to drag me out to the fens to hold a tape measure there was no kind of like technology back in the 80s that you could point a gun and it would give you a quick measurement you actually held a tape measure and that stuff was like you know I kind of felt a little bit alienated at school I never really had a massive group of friends even though I was really sociable and I just kind of enjoyed being on my own, listening to music. And I just had a few friends that kind of understood what what that world was. And, um, you know, I, I think being out there, I kind of felt like a, that kid from that film, Kez, where, you know, I kind of felt really relaxed and would watch hawks and listen to birdsong. And I kind of connected to that. And it's not very rock and roll. And it, it kind of confused me as a sort of kid, but that was really expansive and mind blowing and kind of made me think, okay, you know, I'm this tiny dot in the world and there's all this energy and other stuff going on that, you know, I can't control. And that started to fascinate me. So my dad's a big influence, but as I said, my brother and sister playing me black Sabbath and Kate Bush, you know, when, when I'm like, you know, even pre puberty, that kind of stuff, like what the, you know, yeah. So that yeah, that kind of all crashing together kind of formed Simon wanting to do music, you know. I will never forget my first concert. It was actually at Wembley Arena, Thompson Twins, 1984. I want you to tell us a really special concert in your early formative years that still lingers in your mind. Yeah, I mean, around I on the first well, the first time I ever went to a big show was The Cure, and that was Wembley Arena, funnily enough, in London. And um, oh, what was that? What was the, what was the tour? Do you it remember? Was Kiss, Kiss me, kiss me. Yeah, yeah. And it's really funny because the band we were talking about it not so long ago, and I was like, I couldn't believe it. My sister bought us tickets. I went with her and a bunch of friends, and it was like, and I was kind of like at that point, my hair was out here all black. I loved Robert, <laughs> and yeah, I loved Boris's drumming, who was in the Thompson Twins, coincidentally. And um, and then Rachel's like, oh, I was at that show. And she's like, but I must have been sitting in front of you. I was right in the middle, but I was in row four. No way. Right in the middle, but in row five. So Rachel sat in front of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it turns out that in 1988, I was probably standing next to Christian at a My Bloody Valentine show. And they were supporting <laughs> a little band from Glasgow who were fantastic called the Pastels. But I remember... 
that that gig going down to it was at the Fulham Greyhound, which is in South London, and just you know drinking as much lager as I could possibly drink, getting that pre gig buzz and getting right to the front. And he's like, we we were both at that show, so even though Slow Diver from Reading and I'm from in Cambridge, we were going to London to see the same artist, and we had the same record collections, and I guess that's why I ended up in Slow Dive. You know, when did you realize? Okay, I want to start pr- pursuing music as kind of a a strong interest and or a career? Um, I just think from the people that I knew just piling around to my house and going, can you switch your microphones on and us do that jamming stuff again and let's record one of your songs on the fly. And for about a year, people used to come over to my house after school. I had like these tape players and I had a... At that point, like this battered up electric guitar with a crappy amp, a crappy drum kit, maybe a crappy keyboard, you know, some microphones, a couple of effects pedals that I'd kind of, I worked in a burger joint when I was 14. And I remember one day somebody came in with a bag of pedals and said, if you've got five quid, I'll give you these. So I was plugging them in and just experimenting. And the fact that all my mates wanted me to kind of engineer it and improvise and let them play. And there was, you know, it's kind of stupid and, you know, probably really crappy, but they're just like, how do you do that? How do you come up with songs? How can you like play with these instruments? And it made me think, all right, you know, I, I can, I can, I can make music and I'm obviously quite good at it. So that was the initial encouragement. Um, and then suddenly, I think I was 15, I'd started getting the older kids. There was a sixth form college, um, really good really good sixth form college that kind of its main thing was art and so the art school kids would come and bang on my door and say I heard you're a really good drummer can you come and join our band so I was in a bunch of bands which um you know I kind of realized like all right I'm 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 drumming I must be a pretty good drummer because suddenly I'm in about five bands and that evolved into me joining the Charlottes and that's who Slow Dive poached me from did you take formal lessons of drumming I took some at school, but I'd already bought myself a book of like drumming um, rudimentary tablature and stuff like um, like pads to practice on. So when my mum and dad said, there's a, dr- there's a drummer coming into school and, and, you know, she can teach you drums properly. And I did probably maybe one term, which is about six weeks with her, loved it when she wrote my report she was like he already knows this stuff he's already too good for these lessons so um yeah that was that was again that's another encouraging thing when you're a kid where you just go okay this window is opening even wider i'm going this way you know yeah and i took some classical guitar lessons which um i just found really boring (laughs) but i'm (laughs) you know i'm really glad i did because i have a, a bit of a musical education but you know, me being me, I was kind of impatient and I wanted to I wanted to do better stuff than, you know, like green sleeves on an acoustic. Um, and, I, you know, I'm glad I didn't have too much training because it might have hindered my imaginative, creative ideas. How would you describe your drum style of playing? Very complimentary to the song. OK. Song is king. Um you know, in the Charlottes, I used to drum as fast and as hard as I possibly could yeah. and teared up a whole bunch of kits um, and broke a whole bunch of cymbals. Um, and that was kind of one of the strengths of, like, my first couple of bands are just like, just go bananas. I think somebody, Joe from Dummy, was listening to the Charlottes records the other day and he put on Twitter, like, the Charlottes drumming psycho. And because I loved Motorhead and Sabbath and stuff, I was like, you know, the kind of like 13-year-old 13, 13 in me was like, yeah. But um, Slot Up is very much, it's very expansive. There's loads of space. Um, Neil and Rachel's vocals are like a perfect blend. And I don't want to get in the way of that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, live, I can really tear it up at the end of like a couple of the songs. And I put my kind of, my um musical personality in there um and in the studio i do different stuff it's not just drumming um but yeah complimentary (laughs) i love that uh description 
Okay, so let's start moving into your solo work here. So with your solo work, how do you approach your vision of music when you're with Slow Dive versus when you're working by yourself? Working by myself, there isn't any compromise okay. because I can follow my own creative vision without any distractions, without having to kind of put it out there for a democratic vote. So, um, you know, the, the solo stuff I did, the records on Miasma and Touch and 12K were very much just Simon's world, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and informed by the landscape I lived in or informed by watching too much David Lynch or whatever it is. Um, and, and and that is something that I would be doing anyway, even if record labels weren't interested, I would still be making music. I've always recorded sound and really kind of like been super sensitive to sounds around me. And, um, but with Slow Dive, it's, you know, it, Neil, it's Neil's band in a way, Neil and Rachel. I think Rachel and Neil and uh Nick, <clears throat> they were they were they were like playing together at college um yeah. and doing Velvet's covers and stuff. And you know, Neil's a very, very talented songwriter. He's got a real skill for um for writing a beautiful song. Um and I don't like I said about my drumming, I, as a musician, in whatever capacity I come in at, I don't I don't want to get in the way of that. Yeah. Um, in the same way that if Neil ever played on one of my tracks and he was, you know, trying to force a, an idea in there that didn't quite suit the song, I'd be like, it's not going in, mate, you know. Um, and Neil has a very strong vision for Slow Dive. So the two things really differ. And, um, you know, because I write and because I've always done music, I, I have to have a different outlet. So um, yeah. that's what I'm in, solo, solo records, you know. So from your first earlier solo albums um you know funny until now i want to know how has your how have your skills enhanced improved over time uh great question uh definitely just listening with more agency like more intent on details you know it's very punk rock just to sort of sling on a guitar and bash out a tune i don't care it's you know, it's DIY, it sounds crap, but it's supposed to, you know, actually that's kind of lazy, you know, it's been done before and done really well. Um, and, and I love the whole lo-fi kind of like, it sounds like it's been recorded onto a broken tape. I love those kind of textures and stuff, but I think with the evolution of, you know, Simon Scott as a musician, it's, it's just been to really like listen really carefully um and over time you accumulate the skills of knowing what technology to use and um and that's how i got into doing mastering um by just um accumulating mastering gear and listening uh really really you know deeply to stuff and communicating with other musicians who i work with listening to their ideas um you know even though i'm saying like with the with the simon scott stuff whichever record that is it's it's my creative vision it's it's always really nice to collaborate with other people whether that's someone who's mixing your record or um the label that are putting it out and um you know so listening as a human being i think is a great skill it's very underrated and many people don't listen that well so um you know and, and, and it has helped me Many actors would say the same thing, how important listening is yeah. while while delivering lines. I've heard that from time and time again. Um, I have had the great fortune of speaking with artists that you have done mastering work for, bands, and they've all have really sang your praises in terms of the high quality of work that you've done with mastering their 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 sound their songs um tell us more about this uh business that you've really launched yourself into sps mastering yeah yeah basically i had a really small boutique label for a while called cash and i was 
trying to find people that did mastering and a few friends were helping me out. Um, and one day I think An Anthony from Ison just said, I think I was like, Hey, I've got this really fantastic release. I love it. And it needs to be mastered. You know, can you do it? And he was like, why don't you do it yourself? You've got such a good ear and you've got all this great gear, you know? So, so I did. And that's how it started. And then when, the pandemic kicked in slowed. I've kind of had to stop uh, getting together, obviously to create everything as alive. So it left me with, with a lot of time to twiddle my thumbs. And um, so I just thought, Hey, you know, I'm going to, I really love working with different musicians and I love it when somebody sends me music I've never heard before. And to collaborate with these people, you, you make some great connections. You hear wonderful music. Um, and if you selectively pick the right stuff of really quality um, music, audio, um, it, it's a total, total pleasure. And I think you can hear that in what I do, that I really love it. Um, and that just basically, I think because so many of us were stuck mm -hmm. indoors thinking, all right, you know, what am I doing with my life? A lot of those creative projects that people maybe had on the back burner, they were finishing and going, Simon does mastering. I'll send it to Simon. <laughs> And that's how that started to develop. And a lot of the labels were coming back and saying, oh, that sounded great. Can you do this for me? And I've got this thing coming up in two months and another band coming up at the end of the year. And um, and that was when I kind of thought, hey, these artists or labels keep coming back and I must be doing something right. So it's a total privilege. Are you very Kubrickian when it comes to mastering people's work? By that, I mean extremely attention to detail you will spend hours upon hours and what is what is your process in mastering people's work i, I think it's to keep it really simple if i'm honest with you yeah you really need to listen hard and really tune into the details that the artist has created in their work so it's my job not to screw that up and not to do too much if i'm honest and there's a there's a process of using compressors and limiters and EQs and all these various other kind of hardware units and a few digital units that I throw in there. And, and I like them to be really transparent so that when you master the track and give it back to the artist, it, it sounds they've put all the hard work into mixing it right and recording it with and the microphone placement and all this stuff if i don't go in i'm not like a bombastic mastering engineer where i'm um kind of trying to put my own thing on it my own mastering signature um definitely don't do that i would rather complement what i've been given and just finish it off for the for the artist you know is um I want to take a slow dive into this new outfit that I call Three Quarter Skies, if you don't mind. So um, what is this project? And you have a new album coming out celebrating this work. Give us a little uh, history to this, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It it was um, actually from mastering. I was mastering a band in L.A., and um josiah one of the well, the songwriter he was basically um he was introduced to me and i went down to his studio which is called cave in la and um and he was like oh hey i need to pay you for the album masters and i was like you know what can i just have some studio time because i've got some ideas and i want to come in and um, just really kind of have a, you know, a few days of just making music and seeing what happened. And that's kind of how it started. He was like, yeah, sure, man. Yeah. Come in. I don't know, two weeks time. So I went in and I'd kind of took taken in a modular synth set, um, set up where I could do kind of 909 drums and loop them and, you know, play guitar and, you know, shred my vocals through a bunch of delays and stuff. And I did some live drums and got them back home and there was kind of two or three tracks there and then I carried on writing when I wasn't kind of in the studio with with slow dive and to cut a very long story short I was doing slow dive slow dive played in Berlin in November 22 and then I did a record store kind of improvisation so I'd got this little modular set up and 
some guitar pedals and stuff with me. And Nat from Sonic Cathedral phoned me up and said, hey, I think you're coming back to London today from Berlin. Can you come and support Deary? Because their support band all have flu. And I'm like, uh, I don't know what I do. It's like, you could do anything you like. Just come down. And so I was like, okay. So I jumped off the plane, got in a taxi and went to the show. And, and kind of during the traveling time, I thought, I'm just going to do this new stuff. And I'd already got the name Three Quarter Skies from one of the locals in the area in Cambridge called Defence. They call it Three Quarter Skies because, you know, you get this much landscape and then these really wide skies, which are really beautiful. Okay. So I thought, I've got a project named Three Quarter Skies and I've got these songs I've never done before. So I jumped up on stage and basically because i got stuck in in a, a traffic jam because it was a kfc kentucky fried chicken place on fire i just started scribbling down lyrics and thought i'm going to do this track that's why the debut single was called on fire and i kind of really liked that my everyday experiences are put into this band because you know it's very uncontrived um and i just went up and let rip and you know loop the drums loop the guitars grab my vocal shredded it through a bunch of uh crush delays and then after the show night came up and said like i really want to work with you i really want to put this out and there was the video director there called um chris thompson who's the inner strings guy and he was like yeah we should do something so he made the video for on fire and that's how this all started what a what a privilege and honor to work with him. He's done such great work. Yeah. A lot of tremendous work. Okay, so I want to talk about a few tracks, if you don't mind. Um, the opener, opener, um, there is a phenomenal vibration and, and pulse to that. Um, there was a, a buildup, a swelling, if you don't mind me explaining it that way. What instruments did you use to capture that mood, that essence? That track started from rainfall field recordings, actually. And okay. um, there's like this horrendous torrential rain, felt like maybe, maybe like two or three days of it. And it was this white noise that mm -hmm. uh, just kind of backdropped everything I did, you know. Um, so I recorded it and then played, I think I even played along, I opened my windows to listen to the rain, I was playing along and that's how this kind of like really sort of organic uh, guitar part came along and um, yeah, and just, just kind of a bunch of pro processing through, there's a module called the morphogene that make noise use and it's like a looper, but you can kind of granulate stuff in it. And um, it kind of really suited the kind of pitter patter of the rain and the white noise. And and then I'd been to see Deary play a few times when I was writing the song and I met Ben and Dottie and um, they're a phenomenal group. And Dottie's got this wonderful voice and she sent me a bunch of demos of stuff just to see if I'd be interested in mastering them. And one of them was so sort of bare bones, but her voice had this... Um, I, it just captured me basically. And I and I, I wrote to her and said, Look, your voice is amazing. Can I just take this kind of part and see if it works with the track? She's like, you can do whatever you like, you know. And I added it and it just dropped into place. And she was like, she gave me permission to use it. And um, so she's the female voice on it, which kind of comes in and out and ebbs and flows and makes it kind of oceanic for want of a better word, you know. So that was opener. And and I, it was the first song I played at that show. Okay. As well. So she was there and, you know, felt right. So transitioning to the next track with On Fire, um, in listening to that, it almost seems like an homage, a, a tribute to bands that you really admire, maybe Suicide, Sonic Boom, Spiritualize. Would you mm. say that's true? As yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I absolutely love suicide and that debut album is you know it's in my top three it's incredible and the attitude in there 
J- just the kind of simplicity and how direct it is just you don't need you don't need 17 chords you just maybe need two <laughs> uh, that new york punk thing it's uh it's it's at its finest on that record and um spaceman three you saw them at the notre dame hall in 1987 and they came on with their psychedelic light show and again it was one of those one of those gigs where i went down to london with friends i think christian might have been at that or maybe nick um and they blew my head off and they were you know i think spaceman three suicide loop my bloody valentine cocteau twins at that time i was just obsessed by that stuff yeah um but i mean i definitely didn't write it with a kind of like i'm gonna write a song that sounds like a cross between suicide and spaceman um it just kind of came out like that yeah. And I think me kind of just improvising on vocals has a sort of like suicide quality to it, but the hip, hypnotic repetitism, you know, there's like bands and kraut rock kind of inspiration in there. And, but I, you know, I didn't go into the studio to, to create a track like that. It's just what came out of me. And yeah. and that's why it doesn't fit into the slow dive realm because it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it wouldn't work. Right. I don't think we could do a kraut rock, rock track, even though we've used sort of repetitive loops and rhythms and stuff on the new record. Um, but yeah, yeah, those, you know, Suicide Spacemen are two big influences. Flying Saucer Attack as well, are like a huge influence on me. I love I love that band. And then uh, one more question regarding a, another song, Come Down, has that big glacial feeling to me. Um, and what I really love about that song there seems to be so much tension in the noise. Uh, talk to me about tension within your sounds. Is that something you try to go after? Occasionally, but on this occasion with that song, I'd, I'd been, um, <laughs> I was suffering from a relationship breakup blues. And when I recorded that, I it just became a heavy track you know it actually started really light and kind of ethereal in a way and just the more I worked on that song it became this kind of crushing um maybe not crushing but like it's a a sort of heavy immersive um track you know and the lyrics are kind of buried because they're they're maybe too personal for me to reveal but it's about disappointment it's about like the end of something but also there's kind of i wanted the vocals to have this uplifting um life goes on and you know i've learned a really big lesson here and i'm really thankful for that and death can mean the end of one thing and you you transition into something way better so the vocals actually have kind of a joyousness and I really enjoy singing that. But as you pointed out, the, the kind of music is dense, you know. Um, your music often resonates deeply with, with your fans. What kind of impact do you want Three Quarter Sky's work um, to have on your listeners? What do you hope for them to get out of that experience? I think always when creating songs that you release, um, it's nice to let them interpret it the way they want. I actually find it difficult to kind of say this song's about this and this song's about that. Three Quarter Skies is probably the first time I've ever said, yeah, this track's about this, this track's about that. But I, I, I think because interpretation of music is so subjective it's really nice to just kind of say okay well you you can probably gather there's something going on in this song that may be either love or uh tension or you know whatever it is that you you hear in it and and uh you know just that connection there's a lot of emotional content to to the to the songs but there's also kind of a lot of filth in there i really i really like to play with noise and um you know, I think everybody that listens to it will, will have a different sort of interpretation of the songs. And hopefully they just, you know, I mean, like a song like On Fire, you could just throw on while you're driving and you could just drive and listen to that song. And I'd really like one day to re- release a really extended version where you can go running to it or just drive to the coast listening to that. But, um, yeah, I try not to kind of, I try not to be too blatant about what I'm doing and then just like, Hopefully just their life is enhanced by listening to the music I put out, you know. Are there any social 
or political underlying underpinnings in your music at all? Yeah, but again, it's very buried. Um, a friend of mine recently said, like, there's two things you don't talk about. And one is money and one is your politics, you know. Um, and I kind of agree. And with music, I think I, I, I think it should be the reverse, whereby even though the, the kind of frustrations that we feel living in the world we live in, in whatever country, um, although it tends to be like politics, Politically, there's so much stuff that we're all frustrated about, no matter what country we live in, you know. Um, but I actually think music should be a really good escape from that. So if you're going to come to a show and you're going to enjoy yourself, you know, I don't want to be doing a Joe Strummer and telling the audience that the, the Tory government are, are disgusting and how much I'm upset. I, I would rather it be something more like a David Lynch movie or a Sid Barrett song. It takes you somewhere else. You escape from all the BS for 35 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour or whatever. And then you come back to reality and, you know, deal with, deal with the grind, you know? <laughs> Okay, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. So when does Universal Flames drop? And what's, what are any any shows coming up for this? Yep, uh, October the 26th, it comes out on Sonic Cathedral. Um, I'm really privileged and honoured to to be working with, with that label. Um, and then there's a show the following day um, in London. It's called the, it's a new place. I've never heard of it, but I've, I'm assured it's got a great PA um, and it's in South London and uh, it's um, the 27th. So the day after release, we're playing. Okay. And I've formed a band kind of with some friends. There's um, there's a couple of guys from Cheerless who are a band from Cambridge, but live in London and I've mastered them and they're fantastic. They're kind of like Valentine's E. Um, and then... There's a guy from Fuzzy Lights, um, Xavier Watkins. He's playing some guitar. And then my mate Ivan Rocket Dinning comes in and he's got modular stuff and he's kind of circuit bending and doing some stuff in there as well. Just uh, like I said, I really like to explore noise and textures of, of, of stuff that, as well as beautiful stuff like on Opener, there's also some dense kind of dirty sounds in there. Um, kind of the way Flying Saucer Attack used, you know, like a screwdriver along the along the fretboard with loads of delay, and it kind of it's almost quite filthy and feedbacking, you know. So the show's going to be loads of fun. It's going to be noisy. Um, sadly, we don't have Chris to do our visuals, which is a really important component for us, because you know I think visually a band should kind of like have. Uh, have you know an impressive kind of representation and he's sadly been pinched by Andy Bell for his Glock shows for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Andy's been working with Chris longer than I have, but uh, uh, I really wanted Chris to do it. But um, you know, we can wait for Chris. Maybe, maybe we'll start touring and stuff next year if there's like a window where I'm not playing drums, you know, for slow dive. All right, let's wrap this up. Um, how's the slow dive tour coming along? Um, I'm going to be seeing you in San Francisco next week. Super excited playing at the Warfield. So tell us some remaining dates. And then when do you get a break? Uh, this is my day off. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, I'm really happy to speak to you. And it's really nice to be on the show. So um, that, it's nice to do on my day off. But we're going to Denver tomorrow. We've got to, we've got to be in the hotel lobby at 2 a.m. to jump on the bus to travel there. So, okay. yeah um yeah it's hard work but it's really enjoyable then we do salt lake city portland seattle the warfield two shows in la back to the warfield and then and then maybe get some sleep after that for a week before the uk tour starts and the uk tour starts when it starts a few days after the three quarter skies okay so, um so it starts i think on the 30th and um, that's in Glasgow and it's with Cloth who um, Rachel from Cloth is a really fabulous singer and they're a really great band on rock action. And um, there's a track coming up, which I won't say too much about, but she's doing some some backing vocals on on right. the song that we're putting out in a couple of months. And then anything coming up in 2024? Uh, for Slow Dive or for the Three Quarter Skies? 
either one uh well we're doing a lot of touring next year at slow dive R. um so we've got uh yeah there's a whole bunch of stuff planned which uh, i think is all being finalized but it's going to be a busy year next year and in between being away with slow dive i've got um some new three quarter sky songs to record Great. And it'd be great to do a few more shows, I'm sure. You know, playing live's amazing. You get the energy off the audience. It's a two-way transaction. It's it's um, you know, it's kind of terrifying and exhilarating at the same time. And uh so I want to do that next year if I can. Simon Scott, this has been a great privilege and an honor to speak with you. And I I I want to say thank you so much, not only for your work with Three Quarter Skies that people are going to be hearing about more of and of course slow dive and all that mastering work that you've done um as i've told you before that when i speak with artists who have worked with you they've been extremely complimentary of the professionalism and the the tremendous amount of effort you put into enhancing their songs so thank you for this yeah, it's been a total pleasure thanks for having me on yeah, absolutely. And and uh, much continued success. And again, when does that uh, Universal Flames album drop? October the 26th right. on Sonic Cathedral. We'll keep an eye on it. Well, enjoy the rest of your tour and we shall talk soon and looking forward to seeing you in San Francisco. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon, William. Cheers.